You're listening ad-free on Amazon Music. On a summer morning in 2001, a woman in Alabama woke up in a cold sweat, like she just had a nightmare. But the woman knew what she saw while she was sleeping was not a bad dream. It was real. So she grabbed her phone and made a frantic call. Later that morning, police arrived at an old wooden house on the outskirts of a small rural town. They stepped inside, and they were absolutely shocked, because the woman really had led them to a horrifying crime scene. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of The Strange, Dark, and Mysterious, delivered in story format, then you've come to the right podcast, because that's all we do, and we upload twice a week, once on Monday and once on Thursday. So, if that's of interest to you, please go to the Follow Buttons medicine cabinet and replace everything with laxatives. Okay, let's get into today's story. On the afternoon of June 19, 2001, 44-year-old Debbie Triplett and her husband Billy were stocking shelves in the small country grocery store that they owned in Clay County, Alabama. Billy and Debbie had run the store together for almost 20 years, and they had stocking shelves down to a science. They barely even had to look while they were doing it. So today, like most days, they spent the time talking and joking with each other. For as long as they'd been doing this, Billy and Debbie never got bored working at the store together. In fact, they didn't understand how anyone would get bored working with the person they loved. Because the two of them had been pretty much inseparable from the moment they met back in 1982. At the time, Billy, who was eight years older than Debbie, already owned the grocery store. But he'd been having trouble running it by himself. So, when Debbie came in looking for a job, he'd hired her right away. And it didn't take long for them to discover that they had a lot in common. They were both single parents, they loved living in a small town where they knew their kids would be safe, and they could talk to each other for hours without ever running out of things to say. Billy and Debbie's relationship had quickly gone from boss and employee, to boyfriend and girlfriend, to husband and wife. And their children from their previous marriages ended up loving each other as much as Debbie and Billy did. So they had all quickly formed this really tight-knit, blended family. Now, almost 20 years later, the kids had grown up and moved out, but they all lived close by, so the blended family was still together. In the store, Billy kept stocking the shelves, but Debbie glanced up at the clock hanging over the counter and said that maybe they should call it a day. Billy was supposed to meet up with their son, Randy, and if he wanted to do that and still get home in time for the first pitch of the Atlanta Braves baseball game, he needed to head out now. Everyone who knew Billy assumed he must have been born in an Atlanta Braves baseball cap, because he wore one pretty much every day. They also knew he absolutely hated to miss a Braves game. But today, Billy wasn't sure if he should just take off, because he really didn't like the idea of leaving Debbie alone at the store. The couple didn't like to talk about it, but on a night about three months earlier, when Billy was closing the store on his own, three men wearing ski masks had burst in, duct taped Billy's mouth, shoved him into the walk-in cooler, and then robbed the cash register. By the time Billy had gotten out of the cooler, the men were long gone, but all he could think was, thank God Debbie was not here. Debbie could see the look of concern on her husband's face, and she told him not to worry. Those robbers had not been seen again. Besides, their daughter Michelle was coming by to keep her company for a while, and then she'd close the store because she had dinner plans. Billy thought about it for a second, and then said she was right. So he gave Debbie a kiss and said he would see her at home when she was finished with dinner. Later that afternoon, Debbie's daughter Michelle walked into the store, and the two women immediately started talking like they were best friends. Debbie had Michelle and her brother Michael with her first husband, but they had treated Billy as their dad since they were young, just like Billy's son, Randy, saw Debbie as his mother. Still, Debbie shared a bond with Michelle that was special, even among the kids. They saw or talked to each other every single day. Time always flew by when it was just the two of them, and today at the store was no different. They talked about everything that was going on in their lives, and when Michelle finally caught a glimpse of the clock, she said she needed to head out. But Michelle hesitated, because like Billy, she wanted to make sure her mom would be okay on her own. 
Despite Billy and Debbie rarely talking about the robbery, Michelle and her brothers knew all about it, and they worried about their parents constantly. Debbie said she'd be fine. She could take care of herself, and after all, she'd been closing up the store for two decades. Michelle knew better than to argue with her mother, so she told her that she loved her, and then she left. Debbie worked a while longer on her own, then started closing the store. She emptied the cash register and put all the money into a metal lockbox. She turned off the lights and walked outside with the box under her arm. Then she locked the door behind her and climbed into her minivan that was parked out front. And as she drove down the secluded country road outside the store, Debbie felt excited about her dinner plans and she hoped the Braves were winning so Billy would be in a really good mood when she got home. Early the next morning, Debbie's daughter Michelle sat straight up in bed. Sweat dripped down her forehead, and she could feel her heart pounding. She was terrified, like she'd just had a nightmare. But Michelle knew the fear she was feeling was not because of a dream. Michelle believed that her connection to her mother was something way stronger than a typical bond between mom and daughter. It was almost psychic, like they shared a sixth sense or something. It was like they always knew when the other one was upset or in trouble. And right now, Michelle knew something really bad had happened. She reached over and grabbed her phone off the bedside table and called her mom. When she didn't get an answer, she immediately hung up and called her brother Michael. The second she heard Michael's voice, she said something was wrong with their mom, and since he could get there faster, he needed to get over to her house right away. Michael never doubted the intense connection between his sister and his mom, so he said he was on his way out the door. Michelle hung up the phone, got dressed, and ran out to her car. She sped down the road that cut through most of the small rural towns in Clay County, and then a few minutes later, she turned onto a dirt road that led to her parents' house. As Michelle pulled up in front of the house, she saw her brother pacing back and forth in the yard, and she heard the sound of a police siren in the distance. Michelle got out and ran straight to Michael. He wrapped his arms around her tight and just said, Sister, they're gone. Early that afternoon, Agent Todd Wheels of the Alabama Bureau of Investigation drove down a two-lane road lined by acres of trees on one side and a river on the other. This landscape that would cause most people to feel like they were stranded in the middle of nowhere felt completely familiar to Agent Wheels. He'd grown up in Clay County, which was not too far from here, so for him, it was like he was coming home. That morning, a call had come into the Bureau from the Clay County Sheriff's Department, County deputies had responded to a 911 call at Debbie and Billy Triplett's house. The second they walked inside, they knew the sheriff's department did not have the resources to handle this case, so they had asked the state police for help. Agent Wheels turned onto a dirt road and slowed down as he approached an old white wooden house that sat on a large piece of land that backed up to dense green woods. County police officers had already set up crime scene tape around the perimeter of the house, and a couple of deputies stood out front with a man and a woman in their 20s. Wheels parked his car and looked out at the man and woman, and he felt his heart sink, because he had known both of them since they were little kids. Wheels had grown up in a town not too far from where Michelle, Michael, and their brother Randy lived with their parents, and they had always attended rival schools. So Wheels had seen the entire family at football games, academic competitions, parties, and church functions for most of his life. Wheels took a breath, stepped out of the car, and walked over to Michelle and Michael. He said he hated seeing them under these circumstances, but he needed to look inside the house, and then he would come back out to talk to them. They both nodded like they barely heard what he said, and Wheels ducked under the crime scene tape, put on a pair of gloves, and headed inside. But before he could even take a few steps, he saw Debbie's body lying on the floor. She was surrounded by a huge pool of dried blood, and there was blood spatter all over the walls. Wheels had worked homicides in much bigger places than this, cities that had reputations for violence. But this attack on Debbie looked as gruesome as anything he'd ever seen. He crouched down and found Debbie's purse beside her. He noticed bloodstains inside the purse, and it looked like somebody had rifled through it. Wheels thought this could be a sign that this was a robbery gone bad, that somebody had broken in, and then when they heard Debbie come home, they rushed over and killed her as soon as she walked inside. Wheels left Debbie's body and walked down a short hallway into the family room. And there, on the couch, he saw Billy's body, covered in blood as well. 
This was the first reported double homicide in Clay County in over 40 years, and Agent Wheels could not believe he knew the victims. Wheels approached Billy's body when something on the wall right above caught his attention. When he'd first walked into the room, he thought it was blood spatter, but now he could see it was red lipstick. And someone had used this lipstick to leave a message for the police. It was a single word, NARC. At 4 p.m., several hours after Agent Wheels arrived at the scene, he was back in the family room, staring at the lipstick on the wall for what felt like the tenth time that day. But now, he was with members of a state forensics team that had just arrived. Wheels had gone outside earlier to check on Michelle and Michael, and to ask them if they knew what their parents had been doing the night before. Michael said that he and his wife had met his mom for dinner after she closed the store, and then as far as he knew, she went straight home and both siblings assumed that their dad had watched the Braves game and then just stayed in for the night. Back in the family room, Wheels and the forensics technicians could still not get over the violence that was inflicted on Billy. This was even more brutal than the attack on Debbie. This kind of rage made Wheels think that the attack must have been carried out by someone who had a close emotional connection to Billy, or by someone who was out for revenge. And the word narc also had strong connections to the drug world. As Wheels stood there, fixated on the wall, he heard people shouting outside, and he snapped out of his trance. He immediately turned around and ran out of the house. In the front yard, Wheels saw a man physically struggling with two deputies and yelling that he and his siblings needed to get inside. Their parents were in there. Wheels recognized this man as Billy's son, Randy. Back when they were teenagers, Wheels and Randy had been on their respective high school Scholar Bowl teams, and they had developed a friendly rivalry with each other at academic competitions. Wheels darted across the yard, joined the deputies, and in his calm southern accent, told Randy he needed to back off. Randy stopped struggling and looked up at Wheels, and this look came across Randy's face like he didn't understand why this man was standing there. Randy squinted a little, and then just said, Tom? Agent Wheels said he wished this was not how they were seeing each other for the first time in a while, but he needed Randy to calm down and step back. Randy took a deep breath and apologized to the deputies. He told Wheels he had lashed out because he was mad at himself. He'd missed the messages he'd gotten from Michelle and Michael, and he felt like he'd let his brother and sister down by not getting here earlier. Wheels said he understood. While the two men talked, Wheels heard someone shouting his name from across the yard. He looked over and saw a forensics tech standing by a minivan that was parked near the side of the house. Wheels told Randy to go wait with his siblings, and then he walked over to the van. The front passenger door was open, and the forensics tech said the van had been unlocked. He pointed to the passenger seat, and Wheels saw the keys to the van sitting there. But Wheels also saw something in the passenger side floorboard. It was an open, empty metal box turned over on its side. Wheels called out to the deputies to bring Randy, Michelle, and Michael over to the van. And when the three siblings got there, they didn't look surprised at all. Wheels asked them what the container was, and they told him it was the money box their parents put the cash from the register in every night when they closed the store. And their mom had a terrible habit of just leaving the box in her van when she got home. This clue definitely played into the idea that these murders were connected to a robbery. But maybe it was not a home robbery that got interrupted. Wheels asked the siblings if it was common knowledge around town that their parents put their money from the store in the box every night. Would someone have known Debbie had all that cash and maybe followed her home? The kids looked at each other for a moment, like they were talking without saying anything. And then, Michelle said a few months earlier, their parents' store had been robbed by some men at closing time. So these men might have known exactly where their parents put the money from the cash register. Wheels got a few more details about that robbery, and then he told the siblings they could go. They should have some time to grieve together in private. Wheels spent the whole day at the house, and it was dark outside when he met the members of the forensics team to get a final report for the day. They believed that Debbie and Billy had been killed the previous night. The team had also pulled blood samples from both bodies and from the rooms where they were found, and they had done a thorough sweep of the minivan. But the van appeared to have been completely wiped down before any investigators had even touched it, 
However, investigators were confident that with all the blood and all the fingerprints found inside the house, that they would still likely be able to get the print and DNA samples that belonged to the killer. At the time, DNA testing in Alabama was still a relatively slow process. It could take several weeks or even months to get results. Still, Wheels had a lot of faith in DNA testing, so he was willing to be patient. In the meantime, he had two distinct theories about the case. This was either a robbery gone bad, or Billy really had ratted somebody out to the authorities, likely over something having to do with the drug trade. On June 21st, so the day after the bodies had been discovered, Agent Wheels followed Michelle into her house, which was just a few miles away from her parents, and they sat down together in the small front room. Wheels spoke in the calm voice he almost always used on the job. He said he didn't want to imply that anybody was lying, but he had met with county police, and they had no record whatsoever of a robbery that took place at Billy and Debbie's store. So Wheels wanted to know what Michelle and her brothers had been talking about. Michelle sighed. She and her brothers were telling the truth. There had been a robbery. Their parents had just never reported it. Wheels looked totally confused by this. Why on earth would they keep something like that to themselves? Michelle laughed a little and said it was stupid, but her dad had been illegally selling wine and beer, and even a little moonshine out of the back of the store. And he thought if he reported the robbery, the cops would find out about it. In 2001, Clay County, Alabama was what's known as a dry county. This meant it was illegal to sell any alcohol within county limits. When Agent Wheels heard this news about Billy, he laughed just like Michelle had. This was the kind of thing he'd heard about his whole life growing up in Clay County. He knew Billy wasn't running some major bootlegging operation like people had done back during Prohibition. Instead, he was most likely just selling booze to his friends and to some people from town. But at the same time, Wheels could not shake the image of the word narc written on the wall above Billy's body. So he told Michelle he was not worried about Billy selling alcohol to his friends, but he needed to know if Billy was selling anything else illegal. Was Billy mixed up in the local drug trade? This question absolutely floored Michelle. She said there was no way her dad was dealing drugs. Wheels listened, and he didn't say anything, but he agreed with her. And not just because he had known Billy and the family. Wheels was familiar with the growing methamphetamine problem in the area, And he knew from working with colleagues in the state narcotics unit that a lot of the drugs were coming in from out of state. And that Billy did not fit the profile of most local meth dealers and users, who were often younger guys who didn't have steady jobs. So Wheel stood up and told Michelle that was all he needed for now. He said he'd check in with her as often as he could. But before he made it to the door, Michelle told him to wait. Wheels turned and walked back toward her. Michelle said again there was no way her dad was mixed up with drugs. But... She did know somebody who was. It was a guy named Leonard Southers, and he happened to be one of Billy and Debbie's closest neighbors. Later that day, so still just one day after the discovery of the bodies, Agent Wheels pulled up to a house over a mile away from Billy and Debbie's. Michelle had been right. Everything was so isolated and spread out around here that this was definitely one of the closest homes to her parents. Wheels stepped out of his car, and he saw the lawn was completely overgrown, and there were tools and a bunch of other stuff piled up all around. He took a few steps towards the house, and the screen door flew open. A skinny man in baggy jeans and a t-shirt rushed outside, demanding to know who Wheels was and what he was doing here. Wheels said everything was okay, and then asked the man if he was Leonard. The man nodded and said, who's asking? Wheels introduced himself and said he was with the state police, but Leonard was not in any trouble. In fact, he needed Leonard's help. Wheels took a few more steps towards Leonard, and as he did, he could see track marks on both of his arms, clearly from injecting drugs. And the way Leonard fidgeted and picked at his skin made Wheels think he likely was a meth addict. Looking at Leonard, Wheels mostly just felt pity. This man obviously needed help, but that's not why Wheels was here right now. All of a sudden, Leonard raised both hands into the air to show he was not carrying a weapon, and then he moved towards Wheels. He leaned in really close and then pointed to the trees surrounding his house, and in a hushed voice, he asked if Wheels could see the men up there. Wheels turned and looked up at the trees, and as he did, Leonard started laughing. 
He said the men were in camouflage, so they were almost invisible, but he knew they were there. And he knew they were men like Wheels, agents that the government sent to watch him all the time. As calm as Wheels was, and as genuinely sympathetic as he tried to be whenever he was working a case, he knew he could change his personality on a dime when he needed to. It was like there was a switch in his head. And in that moment, Wheels flipped the switch. He stood up to his full height, raised his voice, and said Leonard was absolutely right. There were agents hiding in the trees. And if Leonard didn't tell him everything he knew about the deaths of Billy and Debbie Triplett, these agents in the trees would swarm. They would take Leonard away, and he would no longer be a free man. Leonard suddenly looked scared, but he quickly said he did want to help. He had heard Billy and Debbie got killed, and he was sad about it. They were nice people, both of them. Wheels flipped the switch again, and his calm voice came back. He told Leonard if he wanted to help, he needed to tell the truth and admit if he had gone over to Billy and Debbie's house to rob them, maybe for drug money. Leonard shook his head. He would never steal from them or try to hurt them. Wheels spoke with Leonard a while longer in the front yard, and by the time he left, he had a primary suspect. Leonard was a drug addict, and he was extremely paranoid. There was even a chance Leonard had convinced himself that his neighbor Billy was going to turn him in to the police for buying and using drugs, which in Leonard's mind would make Billy a narc. In the days following the murders, Agent Wheels had his team dig into Leonard's background and his history of drug use. Still, Wheels did not want to overlook anything, especially if it was because of a personal bias. He did not believe that Billy or Debbie had any connection to the local drug trade, but he needed to make sure. He asked for help from the state narcotics unit, and they said they would search their records to see if Billy or Debbie ever appeared as suspects or informants, or if any agents knew anything about them. In the meantime, Wheels was still waiting on the results of the DNA tests from the blood samples taken at the crime scene. But he did get an update on the fingerprints found throughout the house. At this point, all of the prints that had been pulled matched Billy, Debbie, and their kids, who had provided prints to the county police. So investigators figured the killer must have worn gloves, which probably meant they would not find any useful prints on the cash box either. This was not surprising, but Wheels still got frustrated. The investigation was in its early days, but he had hoped he might get lucky with the fingerprints and find a clear piece of evidence that pointed to the killer. Wheels always felt a real responsibility when investigating a murder to try to bring the killer to justice as quickly as possible, but he knew this case was something different. He had never worked a homicide where he actually knew the victims and their family, and so every day that he didn't find the killer made him feel like he was letting Michelle, Michael, and Randy down. About a week after the murders, Wheels got word from the narcotics unit that they didn't find anything on Billy or Debbie. It seemed pretty clear they had no connection to illegal drugs. In addition to that, because Billy and Debbie never filed a report about that store robbery, there were no leads on the men who had committed that crime. So Wheels was basically where he'd been a week earlier, with the drug addict Leonard as his primary suspect. Still, Leonard being an addict and being paranoid about men in the trees did not automatically make him a killer. Wheels had to find something concrete to tie him to the murders. And about one week later, Wheels was going back over his notes when he got a phone call. And as soon as he heard the caller's nervous, shaky voice, he knew it was Leonard. And Leonard said that Wheels needed to come to his house right away because he had found blood on his money. Not long after this call, Agent Wheels found himself back in Leonard's front yard, not really knowing what to expect or what Leonard finding blood on his money even meant. Leonard stepped outside, walked over to Wheels, and showed him a stack of one and five dollar bills he had in a shoebox. Wheels put on his gloves and picked up a few of the bills, and this didn't look like regular cash. The bills were faded, and there were these weird white spots on them, almost like bleach or something. And in that moment, Wheels understood what was going on, and he just stood there dumbfounded for a second, because he realized someone had put all of this money in a washing machine. They had literally tried to launder the money. This did seem like something Leonard might try, not understanding that money laundering was actually a complex illegal financial process that had nothing to do with detergent or bleach. But as ridiculous as all of this seemed to Wheels, a couple of things about these bills did look like major clues, 
Leonard's money, even after the laundering process, was grouped together in ones and fives, like it would be in a cash register. In addition to that, Leonard had not been using some kind of code or metaphor when he said he found blood on his money. Because even though these bills were faded, Wheels saw several brownish red spots that he believed were bloodstains. To Wheels, this looked like it had to be the money stolen from the cash box that Debbie brought home from the store, and he assumed the blood on the bills either belonged to Debbie or the killer. Leonard must have sensed what Wheels was thinking because he got really jittery and blurted out that this was not his money. He had gotten it from another drug addict that he knew. Agent Wheels chose not to flip the switch in his demeanor. He stayed totally calm and said to Leonard, boy, that sounds like a pretty convenient excuse. But Leonard swore he was telling the truth and he even told Wheels the name of this other drug addict. Wheels said he'd look into it, but he told Leonard he better not leave town. Wheels confiscated Leonard's cash, bagged it as evidence, and brought it to the county sheriff's station. Over the next few days, Wheels and his team dug into the background of this other drug addict that Leonard had mentioned, and then Wheels brought them in for an interview. At first, when Wheels asked about the night of the murders, he felt like he'd been right about Leonard lying. This interview was not going anywhere. But Wheels shifted his focus, and the interview suddenly took a complete turn. Because when Wheels brought up the money with the blood on it, this drug addict shouted, That money you got from Leonard? That's my goddamn money! Wheels just sat there. He couldn't even think of what to say next. He had dealt with a lot of different types of criminals over his career, but he had never heard a suspect just shout out something so potentially damning before. After the interview was over, Wheels let the drug addict go, but he quickly secured a search warrant for the addict's house, and he had the addict's car impounded. And when forensics experts searched the car, they found a faded bloody fingerprint on the driver's side door handle. The sample was sent off to the state lab for testing, and this time, the lab expedited the test. So, on July 26th, a little over a month after the murders, Agent Wheels got back those test results, along with the results from the initial DNA samples taken from the house. And Wheels knew he had found Billy and Debbie's killer. Based on DNA testing, interviews, and evidence found throughout the investigation, the following is a reconstruction of what state police believe happened to Billy and Debbie Triplett on June 19, 2001. That night, the killer quietly walked into Billy and Debbie's kitchen. They could hear the Braves game coming from the TV in the family room. The killer opened a drawer and pulled out a sharp knife. They carefully slid the knife into their back pocket and then walked into the family room. Billy sat up on the couch and the killer immediately started shouting at him. Billy shouted back and was about to get off the couch, but the killer ran across the room and leapt on top of him. They struggled, but the killer pinned Billy down and without even looking, grabbed something heavy off the coffee table and started wildly slamming it into the side of Billy's head. Blood sprayed on the walls and all over the couch as Billy stopped moving. The killer got up, drew the knife from their pocket, grabbed Billy, and slit his throat. But the killer didn't stop. They kept digging the knife deeper into Billy's neck until they had almost decapitated him. Finally, the killer stepped back, walked away, and went to the kitchen. They washed the knife off, rinsed their hands and face, and set out some cleaning supplies. Then they picked the knife back up, went to the family room, sat down, and waited while the baseball game kept playing on TV. At 10 p.m., a few hours after the killer had arrived at the house, they heard a car pull up outside. They quickly turned off the TV and ran toward the front of the house, carrying the knife and the blunt object they'd attacked Billy with. They flipped off the light in the entryway and crouched down against the wall not far from the door. The killer heard footsteps just outside, and they clutched the knife tight. The door unlocked, and the killer saw it swing open. And before Debbie could even turn on the light or call to her husband, the killer leapt out of the darkness, grabbed her, slammed the blunt object into her head, and cut her throat too. Debbie's body collapsed just inside the door. The killer flipped on the light, put the knife back in their pocket, and grabbed Debbie's purse. They took out Debbie's car keys, and they saw a tube of lipstick. 
They walked into the family room, and with the lipstick, they scrawled the word NARC on the wall over Billy's body. After that, they walked through the house, got the cleaning supplies they'd laid out in the kitchen, and then stepped over Debbie's body and went outside to her minivan. The killer opened the passenger door and saw the metal cash box on the floorboard. They found the key for the box on Debbie's keyring they'd stolen, opened the box, and stuffed the money from it into their pockets, getting blood from their hands all over the cash. The killer quickly wiped down the van with the cleaning supplies and tossed Debbie's keys onto the passenger seat. Then they ran to their car with their hands and pockets filled with cash, cleaning supplies, lipstick, and the murder weapons, and they drove straight home. The following morning, the killer woke up and saw several messages, but they ignored them and waited until later in the afternoon to go back to their parents' house. The bloody cash that Leonard had in his possession was the money from the cash box, but Leonard had told the truth. Another drug addict had given him that money. And this drug addict was Billy's son from his first marriage, Randy. And Randy was the killer. It turned out Randy's drug habit had been going on for years. He struggled to get work, and he almost never had any money. Billy had continually bailed his son out financially, but recently, Billy, and especially Debbie, had just had enough, and Billy had met with his son more than once to tell him they were cutting him off. On the night of the murder, Randy already felt angry and betrayed by Billy and Debbie, and so when he got to the house and saw his dad on the couch, he begged him to give him more money. But Billy said no way, he needed to get his act together and clean up his life. After that, Randy got the knife, argued with his dad again, and then attacked him on the couch with a blunt object, and then slit his throat. Hours later, Randy used the same weapons to kill Debbie. After murdering his dad and stepmom, Randy had the idea to try to make it look like a drug-related murder, so he wrote NARC on the wall in lipstick. And he figured if that didn't work, police would assume this crime was connected to the earlier robbery at his parents' store. And Randy was right. Investigators focused on both of these theories. But during the investigation, Randy started to panic. And at one point, he literally tried to clean the blood off the cash he had stole in the laundry machine. But when that didn't work, he just gave the bloodstained cash to Leonard, assuming Leonard would hold on to it for him and keep quiet until the investigation died down. But Leonard called Agent Wheels and told him that Randy, who he'd known for a long time and who he did drugs with, was the person who gave him this money. Then, when Randy came in for questioning, he inexplicably shouted out that the blood-stained money was his. Wheels then moved in on Randy, his former Scholar Bowl rival, and had his car impounded. And the DNA sample that was taken from Randy's car door handle would match DNA samples from the crime scene. The blood belonged to Debbie, and Randy had just gotten some of it on his car after killing her. Randy was sentenced to life in prison without parole. But in 2016, he hanged himself in his prison cell. Michelle still thinks about her mother all the time, and she continually reminds people to hug the ones they love, because nobody, no matter how deep a connection they share, knows how much time they have together. In the 1970s, a young woman and young man were on their very first date together, and it wasn't going very well. It wasn't going badly, it was just really, really awkward. They just were not meshing at all. And so as they're getting ready to leave and retire for the night, the guy is thinking to himself, I have nothing to lose here, we're probably not going to go on a second date. And he says to the woman, hey, do you want to not go home right now and actually come on a hike with me? And he goes, I know this sounds like a terrible idea, but hear me out. I go mountain climbing in this area called Provo Canyon. It's not that far from here. There are these beautiful trails that lead up the side of the canyon to these amazing scenic overlooks. And tonight it's a new moon, so there's great visibility. And I just think that you might enjoy it. And so at first, the woman is obviously a little bit hesitant. But when he says, look, I go hiking there at night all the time. I love it out there. And I promise if there's any weirdness, if you don't like being there, we'll just turn around and leave. It's totally safe. And so after a little bit of coaxing, she finally says, okay, you know what? That sounds fun. Let's go do it. 
And so their date that had been really awkward suddenly became really exciting. And the two of them were kind of like thrilled, like, wow, look at us making our way up for a nighttime hike through Provo Canyon. And so they arrive at the, the mouth of this canyon and they're both obviously excited and they hop out and they start walking up this trail that brings them into a heavily forested section of the canyon. Now to this point, the guy felt like this was a really great idea. He really had gone hiking here a bunch and he really did know the area well. But as the trail brought them into the forested area, the guy remembers feeling this overwhelming sense of dread. He didn't know why, it was just like an overwhelming sense of anxiety that something bad was going to happen to them. But he had worked so hard to convince his date to come with him and had convinced her it was safe that he's not about to let on to her that there was anything wrong with what they were doing. And so he put on, you know, his strong face and just kind of suppressed it and just kept on walking and, you know, holding her hand tight and they just continued their walk. But his sense of dread would just build and build to the point where he was really on edge. And what he didn't know, but would find out later, is that his date, the woman, she also had this horrible sense of dread as soon as they went into the forest, but she didn't want to tell him because she didn't want to seem like a party pooper because he seemed really excited about it. At some point as they're walking down this path, the man steps on something that felt soft. He didn't know what it was, but it caused him to freeze immediately. And he's holding her hand. He kind of jerks her to get her to stop. And before he can even look down and see what he's standing on, he hears rustling coming from the bushes just off the trail. She hears it too. And both of them, without saying a word to each other, because again, you got to remember, they're both really stressed. They haven't let on to the other how stressed they are, but they're both basically ready to leave. And so the two of them turn around and they hightail it out of there. He has no idea what he stepped on. They don't know what they heard in the bushes, but they don't care. The anxiety was so high, they just wanted to leave. Years later, that man and woman who had this very strange date would actually be married. And they'd be sitting down watching TV together and they're flipping through the channels and they land on an interview with a death row inmate. And the interviewer is asking the inmate, was there ever a time that you were almost caught red-handed? And the guy being interviewed says, yes, one time. I was in the forest up in Provo Canyon one night and a young couple came walking up the trail. I didn't see him. So I only had a chance to jump into the bushes right next to the trail. And the guy actually stepped on the body of a girl I had just killed. But for some reason, he didn't look down and see what he was standing on. And the two of them didn't notice me just a few feet away from them. They just turned around and walked away. Turns out that young couple had run into one of the worst serial killers of all time, Ted Bundy. Before Bundy was executed, he confessed to over 30 murders. But many people believe the true number of victims is much, much, much higher. Our next story is called Parents Know Best. After spending 21 years in the U.S. Army, a man retires and moves to Central Florida with his wife and young son. Although his family had plenty of money because he had a pension coming in and his wife still worked full time, he just got bored really quickly after moving to Central Florida and decided he would just take a job doing something just to stay occupied. And so he ended up taking a job at a highway gas station. One of the primary reasons he chose this particular job is because the owners of the gas station didn't care if his son came along to help him stock shelves and hang out behind the cash register. And so for years, that's just how it went. The man would work at the gas station and his son would tag along. Even after his son became a teenager and you'd think might be wanting to do other things, well, the town was so small, there was almost nothing to do. So his son still came along well into his teenage years. One night in 1990, his son, who was 15 years old at the time, was at the station and he was actually taking a break sitting outside on a picnic table. He was reading a magazine, drinking a Mountain Dew, and you know, it's dark out, and he notices out of the corner of his eye that there is a woman walking off of the highway towards the gas station. It was a very quiet night at the time, so there's no cars getting gas, there's nobody there, and there's not really anybody even driving on the highway, and so that's why she really stood out to him. And he turns and he notices her, and he thinks to himself, you know, no one ever walks to our gas station, we're on a highway, everybody drives here. So she must have broken down and she must be coming here to try to use our phone to call a tow truck or something like that. So the woman is walking across the lot, coming closer and closer to the gas station. And the boy at this point has turned his attention back to his magazine. But he would say later that he kept looking up and keeping an eye on her because there was something off about her. 
The woman ultimately walks right behind him and goes in the door into the gas station. Doesn't acknowledge the boy, doesn't say hi to him, just walks straight inside. And she starts walking up and down the aisles of the gas station. Now, from where the boy was sitting, it's all glass, so he could clearly look in and see his father behind the counter, and he could see the head of this woman as she walked in and around all these aisles. And as soon as the woman was in the store, kind of pacing around the aisles, the boy put his magazine down and was just watching. And he noticed that she was not really shopping. She was just looking down for a few seconds, wouldn't pick anything up, so she wasn't buying anything. And she would look up at the counter where his father was, and she would just stare at him, and then she'd look back down at what she was doing, and she would go through all the aisles. And at some point, the woman just kind of abandons this phony, I'm pretending to shop routine, and just walks up to the counter. Now, nobody else is in the store. There's nobody else coming in. And so the boy could actually fairly clearly hear what she was saying to his father. And she told his father that she had broken down and she needed a ride and could he drive her to Ocala, which was the next big town north of this gas station. And the boy would say that his father acted very strangely because his father is normally incredibly pleasant with all the customers. He's very chatty even. Like he talks to everybody who comes in the store. But as soon as this woman had gone in, his dad had seemed kind of dismissive and almost rude to this woman. And when she was talking to him, asking for a ride, he just said, no, I won't give you a ride. The woman is annoyed by how quickly she's been shot down. But instead of just taking no for an answer, she turns and looks at the boy, the boy who's sitting out on the bench, who's looking right at her, and she points at the boy and she says, what about him? Is he your son? Can he give me a ride? The boy notices that his father, who's not within her eyesight, is looking at his son going, no. Like, whatever she wants from you, you're going to say no to it. And the boy's a little bit confused by this because he's still trying to understand why his dad was so against helping this woman because she clearly needs our help or someone's help. But he just took his dad at face value. And when the woman's pointing at him, he knew, the boy, that if she came over and asked him, he would say no. But it wouldn't come to that because the boy's father would say to the woman, no, my son's not going to give you a ride. You need to leave here immediately. Do not come back. Leave. We're not going to help you. She's furious, she's cussing him out, she storms out and slams the door, she starts cussing at the boy, and she walks off the whole time she's turning around and flipping them off and screaming profanities at them, but she ultimately walks off, and the dad kind of followed her out and is standing next to his son as she walks off. And the boy asks his dad, like, what, what was her deal? Why did that happen? Why did you, why did you not want to help her? And the dad just said, I don't know, there was just something, there was something off about her, and I, I don't know how to place it, but I did not want her around you. I, I knew I didn't want to give her a ride, I just, I knew she had to go. A year later, the boy is in his room when he hears his dad in the other room yelling for him to come in here and look at the TV. So he runs into the TV room, and on the TV is the same woman from the gas station better known as Eileen Warnos, she was a serial killer who used to pick up her male victims at gas stations in Florida. It's unclear whether the boy or the boy's father were her next victims, but by the time she had shown up at that gas station, she had already killed four people. And following that interaction with them at the gas station, she had gone on to kill three more people, including someone in Ocala, Florida, which was the town she had asked them to give her a ride to. Eileen had been caught, that's why she was on TV, and she was later sentenced to death. The next and final story of today's episode is called That'll Do Pig. By most people's standards, Susan Monica's life had been pretty good. She had a small but very close group of friends, she had a great job working as an engineer, and she lived in one of the most exciting cities in the world, San Francisco, California. But Susan was not happy. Moving to the big city was not so much a choice as it was a product of life and circumstance. Deep down, Susan had always been someone who preferred peace and quiet and being alone, things that were in rare supply in a big city like San Francisco. Many nights after work, Susan would come home to her apartment and she would sit there and dream about moving away from the city and living off the grid somewhere on a farm, you know, raise her own food and be totally self-sufficient away from everybody else in the world. And then one day in 1991, when Susan was 43 years old, she made that dream a reality. That year, she wound up purchasing a 20-acre farm located in a forest in a little town in Oregon called Weimar. However, this farm was really not a farm. 
There was nothing on it. There was no house for Susan to live in. There was no barn for her animals or tools. There was no running water, no electricity, no septic system. It was just pure Oregonian wilderness. But to Susan, it was perfect. The property kept her far away from other people, and she liked the idea of having to literally build her own farm. After all, she was an engineer by trade, so she actually knew how to build buildings efficiently and safely, and she was a big, strong, sturdy woman who was not afraid of manual labor. So when Susan finally arrived in Weimar and made her way up the winding dirt road through the forest and arrived in front of her property and looked out at the vast, rugged landscape for the first time, she was filled with a rush of excitement. Even though there was nothing on her 20 acres, it already felt like home. Over the next several months, Susan would transform these 20 acres into a neat little farm, complete with a big barn and a shack for her to live in and a few animal pens for livestock. However, after the farm was built, Susan realized that building the farm was actually not the hard part. The hard part was maintaining the farm, going out there every day and doing all of her chores, feeding all the animals and doing all the different projects she had in mind. It was exhausting. And so not long after the farm was complete, Susan realized that as much as she wanted to be totally alone out there, she had to set that aside and hire some help. And so Susan printed out all of these help wanted flyers and put them all over town in Weimar. And before long, people began making their way up to her property to inquire about the role. Most of these applicants were people who struggled to find work elsewhere, either because they lived a sort of transient lifestyle, bouncing around from place to place so no one was ready to hire them long term, or because they had a criminal record and just straight up could not get a job. But Susan didn't care about either of those things. All she cared about was the people she hired would work hard and they would respect the peaceful, calm atmosphere she was fostering on her farm. Basically, do the work and leave me alone. And over the next 20 years, Susan would find dozens of people who were able to do just that. Most of them would work for Susan only for a short period of time. Others would stick around for a little bit longer, but eventually all of Susan's workers kind of rotated pretty quickly and moved on to other things. And when that happened, Susan would simply put up more help wanted flyers in town and hire more people. And in all the 20 years that Susan had been hiring these temporary workers at her farm, after they did move on and went somewhere else, Susan never heard about them again. However, that was about to change. On January 1st, 2014, Susan, who was 66 years old by this point, was outside of her shack out on her driveway when she happened to look up and see a car coming up her road. Now remember, she lives in the middle of nowhere. No one comes out to see her. So this is a very rare event. And so Susan is totally keyed in on this car. And this car, they pull into her driveway and then out of the car pop three young people. It was two young men and one young woman. And before Susan could even ask them who they were or why they were here, they were telling her. They said they were looking for their father, Robert Haney, who at one point had told them he was working on Susan's farm in exchange for a little cash. And also Susan was letting him park his camper on her property and he was living in that camper. The kids said their father always checked in with them at least once every couple of months, but they had just gone this really long stretch without hearing from him. And since he didn't have a cell phone and no permanent address, they had no real way of getting in touch with him. And so they were out there looking for him to make sure he was okay. And so they asked Susan, do you remember our dad, Robert? And if so, do you know where he is? Even though this whole situation was totally surprising for Susan because she almost never got visitors. So that alone was kind of jarring for her. But when she heard the kids say their dad's name, Robert Haney, she immediately knew who that was. Susan told them that she had hired their father the previous spring to help build a structure on her farm. And initially, Robert was really nice to have around the farm. He worked really hard, he kept to himself, he was quiet, and he had a dog that was really friendly and loving. But in August of the previous year, so five months into Robert's employment on Susan's farm, Susan would tell them that their dad totally changed. He started drinking really heavily and not really working very much and spending a lot of the day just kind of ranting and raving outside of his camper about how he wanted to exact his revenge on someone. Susan would eventually find out that what Robert was talking about is apparently one of his kids had been assaulted and he felt very guilty that he had not been there to protect his child. And so the way Robert was handling this guilt was by drinking and thinking about getting his revenge on the attacker. 
Now, while Susan did understand why Robert felt the way he did and why he was kind of acting the way he was, it didn't change the fact that Robert's behavior had become very disruptive on her farm, and the one thing Susan really wanted was peace and quiet. And so she decided she would have to go confront Robert about his behavior and potentially fire him if he couldn't find a way to calm down. But before Susan ever had to do that, Robert one day just walked right up to her shack, he handed her an envelope filled with cash, and he asked Susan if she wouldn't mind looking after his dog for a while. And Susan was so taken aback by his complete change in behavior and this request that she just took the envelope and said, okay, I'll look after your dog. And then Robert nodded his thank you, he turned around, and he walked away from her. And then a few moments later, Susan's standing there with the envelope in hand, watching as Robert is climbing into some white car that had just pulled up in front of the property. She didn't know who was in the car with him. And then the car turned around and drove out of sight. Susan told the kids that that had happened back in September, so about four months ago. And since he left, she had not heard from him, despite the fact she still had his dog. And she told the kids that a lot of Robert's stuff was still in his camper. Susan brought the kids over to the side of her property where Robert's camper was, and when they went inside, sure enough, all their father's things were all over the place. But the one item that immediately stood out to them was their father's tool belt. They knew their father was a traveling handyman, that was how he made his living, and so it begged the question, why would he leave his tool belt here if he knew he was going to be gone for several months potentially? It didn't make any sense. After leaving Robert's camper, the kids thanked Susan and asked her to please be in touch if she learned anything else about their dad, and she said she would. And then the kids got back in their car and they began driving south towards the Jackson County Sheriff's Office. When they got there, they asked to file a missing person report for their dad. However, they learned very quickly that it was going to be very challenging to locate their dad because their dad lived this transient lifestyle with no cell phone, he had no permanent address, he had nothing that could really be traced. But the investigators agreed with Robert's children that their dad's absence was a big concern given the fact that his last interactions with Susan had consisted of him drinking very heavily and talking about going and getting his revenge on his child's attacker. And so the sheriff and the deputies were very concerned that that was exactly what Robert had done. He had gone out and potentially murdered someone and now was in hiding. So they asked Robert's kids if they could think of absolutely anything that could possibly allow investigators to track down Robert. And at some point, one of the kids said, oh, what about my dad's EBT card? EBT cards, or electronic benefit transfer cards, are like debit cards for state welfare services. You can use the cards to buy things like groceries, and the cards are definitely traceable. A few days later, when Robert's EBT card trace came back, investigators saw the card had been used just one month earlier in a Walmart located about 30 minutes southwest of Susan's farm. Now, this trace obviously didn't tell investigators where Robert was right now or what kind of condition Robert was in, but they had no other leads to operate on, so they decided they would go to the Walmart and see what they could find. When they got there, the investigators were led to the back room of the building where they were able to review the security footage from the previous month when Robert was supposedly there with his EBT card. But after reviewing hours and hours and hours of footage, the investigators never saw Robert on camera. However, they did see Susan on camera, and unbelievably, she was the one using Robert's EBT card. And so obviously this was very suspicious and right away the investigators left the Walmart, went back to their office and began the process of getting a search warrant to search Susan's farm. A few days later on January 10th, the sheriff and his deputies arrived at Susan's property and when they pulled onto her driveway, Susan came outside to greet them. When she asked them, you know, what's going on? They told her, hey, we're here to search your property in connection with Robert Haney's disappearance. And before Susan could ask any more questions, the sheriff said to her, hold on, just turn around, let's go back inside, I need to talk to you privately. And so Susan, who was very shocked by this, just said, okay, and she turned around and led the sheriff into her house while the other deputies fanned out across the property to begin this big search. Once inside of Susan's house, they sat down in her kitchen and right away the sheriff says to Susan, okay, I have you on camera using Robert's EBT card. I know you stole it, so you need to tell me where Robert is right now or it's gonna get a whole lot worse for you. 
And as soon as he said this, Susan's look of shock on her face quickly turned into a look of kind of relief. It was like suddenly she understood what was going on here. And she says to the sheriff, no, I didn't steal his EBT card. He gave it to me along with an envelope full of cash when he left four months ago. And he told me to use it to buy dog food for his dog that I'm looking after. And since Robert had been gone for all these months, she had run out of cash to pay for the dog food and now was using the EBT card. Susan also added that if she had just stolen the card from Robert, she wouldn't be able to use it because it requires a PIN number. And Robert gave her the PIN number. That's how she was able to use it. The sheriff was not totally sold on Susan's story, and so he continued to ask more questions, trying to trip Susan up about how she came to acquire this card. But Susan was very firm that Robert had given her the card, and that was it. And so after several minutes, the sheriff realized that Susan was likely telling the truth, which meant the EBT card angle was likely a dead end, and they would have to call off the search. But as the sheriff was standing up to leave the kitchen and leave the property altogether, a deputy from outside came running into the kitchen and without saying a word, just bent down and whispered something into the sheriff's ear. And as the sheriff is listening to this deputy, his face is contorting in disgust. He can't believe what he's being told. And after the deputy stands up and leaves the kitchen, the sheriff takes a deep breath and then looks at Susan and says, ma'am, you're gonna have to come with us. Back at the station, a now very flustered Susan was led into a small interrogation room where she sat down looking totally anxious. She's looking around, wondering what's going on. And then the sheriff walked into the room, immediately hit record on the camera, and then looked at Susan and says, has anyone died on your property? The story that Susan would tell the sheriff that day in the interrogation room was so completely unexpected and horrific, it would make headlines all across the country. Before Susan began this story, she told the sheriff that everything she had said about Robert Haney's disappearance had been the truth. However, she had left one little detail out. After Robert had handed Susan that envelope full of cash and the EBT card, and then climbed into that stranger's car and driven away, after that, Robert had actually come back to her farm and recently. Susan said she discovered his return when one morning she got up and she went outside to go feed her animals when she looked over at the pig pen and saw all the pigs who would normally be laying down and lounging around at that time of the day. They were all up and they had converged in one portion of the pig pen and they had kind of formed a circle around something on the ground as if they were all trying to look at something on the ground. Now, Susan said this was totally uncharacteristic, so obviously something weird was going on. And so Susan dropped her food and rushed over to the fence. She climbed into the pig pen, and as she got closer and closer to all these pigs, she realized they weren't just looking at something on the ground, they were eating something on the ground. And so Susan goes right up to this ring of pigs, and she begins pulling them aside, and then right in the middle on the ground is Robert. He was laying on his back and his insides had all been torn out. It was like the pigs were disemboweling him. And the most shocking thing is Robert was still alive. He was moving his arm and groaning. Susan tried to pull the pigs off of Robert, but she said they kept coming back and really aggressively continued to eat Robert. It was like they were in this feeding frenzy. And so Susan said, you know, I thought about lifting him up and moving him, but Robert was practically split in two, and she felt like if she tried to move him, that would kill him anyways. And so Susan said she did the thing that she thought was right at the time. She left the pig pen, went into the barn, got a shotgun, ran back to the pig pen, raised the weapon, and fired it into Robert. Susan told the sheriff that this was purely an act of mercy. She was ending his suffering. After Robert was dead, Susan said she just left the pig pen, and then three days later, she went back into the pig pen with bags and collected the little bits of Robert that had not been eaten by her pigs. And then she took those bags of remains and chucked them into her barn on top of the trash pile. But clearly, Robert's remains had not remained in the barn because the thing that deputy had whispered into the sheriff's ear when the sheriff was talking to Susan in the kitchen was... Sir, we found a leg outside. It was Robert's leg, and it was found not inside of the barn in the trash pile, but out in the middle of her property, just out in the open. Susan, when confronted with that information, suggested that, you know, maybe a wild animal had gone into the barn, got a hold of it, and dragged it off. 
The sheriff didn't even know what follow-up questions to ask. And so he just said, well, why didn't you call 911 when you first saw Robert? I mean, maybe we could have saved him. Or at least after he was dead, why didn't you tell someone? Susan would say that the reason she didn't tell anyone is she was afraid that if word got out about what her pigs had done, then her pigs would be euthanized and she would lose a major revenue stream because she sold her pigs meat in town. And she said even if her pigs were not euthanized, she was worried people in town would not want to buy her pigs meat after they learned her pigs were attacking and eating humans. Susan would tell the sheriff exactly where they could find the bags that contained Robert's remains, and she even said she would take a polygraph test to show she was now telling the whole truth. But when she actually sat down to take the polygraph test, she kept fidgeting and coughing and doing these really dramatic sighs, and it was causing the test operator to get really inaccurate readings. And so when this first polygraph test was over, the results were inconclusive. And so the investigators made Susan take another test, but again, she continued to fidget and yawn. And so finally, the investigators in the room watching this happen just called off the test. And when they did, they said to Susan, you know, hey, we're going to search your farm. And if there is anything on your farm that you have not told us about, you're going to be in serious trouble because we're going to find it. At this point, Susan kind of stopped fidgeting and she looked up at the investigators. And after a long pause, she reached out across the table and grabbed a piece of paper and a pen. She pulled it back and she began drawing something. And after a few seconds, it became pretty clear she was drawing a map of her farm. And after the map was all drawn out, she drew a big X in the middle of it and then slid the map back across the table to the investigators. And she said, if you go to that X, you'll find Steven. And the investigators are like, who's Steven? We're talking about Robert. What are you talking about? Well, it would turn out Robert was not the only farmhand to die on Susan's property. In 2012, about a year before Susan hired Robert, she hired another man named Steven Delacino. And according to Susan, Steven was a lot like Robert. He was really easy to get along with. He was quiet. He worked hard. But at some point, Susan said they had a big falling out. Susan said she started to suspect that Stephen was stealing her guns in her barn, and so she went to confront him. And during this confrontation, they got into this big fight, and Susan said she didn't really remember all the details of what happened next, but at some point during this fight, a gun went off, and then Stephen fell to the ground in the middle of the pig pen with his head bleeding, and all of Susan's pigs suddenly swarmed him and began eating him. The stunned investigators again asked Susan, okay, if that really happened the way you said it did, why didn't you call 911 if this was like an accident? And Susan would say again that her big fear was her pigs would either be euthanized or word would get out that her pigs were eating people and the people in town would not want to buy her pig's meat because of that. In the end, as far-fetched as Susan's stories were about what happened to Robert Haney and Stephen Delacino, there was never any evidence that actually contradicted her claims. And so as a result, when Susan went on trial for murdering Robert and Stephen, it came down to whether or not the jury believed Susan. And they didn't. Not at all. They believed that Susan was completely lying and that in reality, Susan, who was known to have a very quick temper, shot Stephen and shot Robert very much on purpose and then threw them into her pig pen. We can only hope they were dead before her pigs began eating them. On April 21st, 2015, more than a year after Robert's children had reported him missing, Susan was convicted of two counts of murder for Robert and for Stephen and two counts of abusing a corpse. She was sentenced to a minimum of 50 years in prison. While in custody, Susan would be overheard saying there were 17 other bodies buried on her property. However, when the police went out there and searched again very extensively, they never found any other remains. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin Podcast. If you like today's story and you're looking for more strange, dark, and mysterious content, be sure to check out all our studio's podcasts. They are this one, the Mr. Ballin Podcast. We also have Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries, Bedtime Stories, Wartime Stories, and also Run Fool. To find those other podcasts, thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin Podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please offer to make the Amazon Music Follow button a cup of coffee but be sure it's full of coffee grounds. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, 
But in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories we have posted on our main YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. We have a registered 501c3 charitable organization called the Mr. Ballin Foundation that honors and supports victims of violent crime as well as their families. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive